So, so, key, so think about neurofeedback as one of the best ways I describe neurofeedback is think of it as physical therapy for the brain. And we have different types of uh, treatments uh, that you all have like experienced as you've had the brain injuries. And neurofeedback is one where we're directly able to assess what regions of the brain are still struggling and how can we get those areas strengthened. So where is the, where is the fragility in the brain? And then what can we do to strengthen that area? So that's where, where the placement of my sensors becomes a very critical part of my treatment. So with brain injuries, it's, um, there was a very big study that was done with um, an NFL study that was done a few years ago. And what they did is in that study, looking at the brain, the brain injuries that our football players have, uh, there's a particular system that they had used for that study that's called direct neurofeedback. So there is, in neurofeedback, you have what we call non-invasive neurofeedback. Most of neurofeedback, most traditional neurofeedback will be non-invasive. So the way it kind of works is you are sitting in a room with a screen in front of you. I try to give you some good distance from the screen so you're not overwhelmed. And then there's one of my systems is there's a teddy bear on your lap. There's a visual stimulation you have. And then there's auditory, there's sound that comes out of it. So what I'm doing on my end is I have certain frequencies that I'm going to. And what you're doing is your job is to just sit there and relax and enjoy. You might be watching a movie or you might be uh, flying a spaceship through a tunnel. We're using tactile, auditory, and visual feedback to rewire the brain. That's traditional neurofeedback. That's what we call non-invasive neurofeedback. The machine that I purchased after the study that was done with the NFL players is called direct neurofeedback. And another word for direct neurofeedback is microcurrent neurofeedback. So what you're getting is you're receiving a tiny stimulation microcurrent into the brain. And I call that my reboot and rewire because that's definitely a little, but the current you receive is even less than what we get with our cell phones. I mean, it's minute. Yes, sir? What is tactile stimulation? This what is that? So it's, it's, a, it's a teddy bear. And inside it, it has a vibrating thing. And so it vibrates and it vibrates at 32 hertz. And the 32 hertz is a vibration that we know soothes the body, calms the body down. So it relaxes. It relaxes the person. Yes, exactly. It relaxes, it relaxes the person. So that relaxes you, then you've got auditory visual going on, and this relaxes. This is relaxes you. So ideally, what, what my, my patients will say is, I find if you're riding the spaceship, the only prompt I'm going to give you is see, you know, if you're able to get it to go at a fast pace. Um, and even if it's going at a slower pace, the brain is still doing the work because what we're doing is neurofeedback. Think of it as operant conditioning. So we're in, we're telling that particular region of the brain that when you come to this frequency, I'm going to reward you. So the brain gets rewarded. And the way the brain gets rewarded is the monkey buzzes, the teddy bear buzzes a lot. The spaceship goes really fast and the volume goes up. So you get three stimulants that you receive. And that, and I kid you not, means you get tired. When you leave the session, you can tell your brain has done a lot of work. So I always tell my patients that, you know, make sure you're fed really well before you come in and make sure you've had a snack. And then also, if you feel a little tired and you just need to rest in my waiting room for a little bit of time, just have a seat, relax a little bit before you get in your car or your bus or have in your transportation home. So it is, it, is a, it is physical therapy for the brain. Remember how when we go for physical therapy, usually you come out fatigued and you come out feeling so tired. So keep that in mind when you engage in your feedback is that there's a lot of work you're going to be doing. 
with the brain. You might hear brain training. Some of the words you hear for neurofeedback might be neurotherapy, neuromodulation, neurofeedback, brain therapy. Those are some of the words that people interchangeably kind of use when they're talking about neurofeedback. It's always a good question to ask if you're looking at neurofeedback providers. Ask them, you know, what, what is it non-invasive? Is it invasive? What type of feedback do you have? Do you do a brain map before you do the neurofeedback? I only started, honestly, I've been doing this for 12 years, but I only started adding brain maps to my practice last year. And the reason I add them is because a lot of patients are very intrigued about, okay, so specifically where in my brain is, is the dysregulation? So I, I still use the same systems I use. My treatment protocols kind of are very similar to what I was doing before I even added the QEG because I have so much clinical experience, so many years of experience, knowing where I was getting the success. Uh -huh. The brain map like a functional MRI? It is not a functional MRI. It's called a quantitative EEG. QEEG is the brain map. I'll show you some pictures of what kind of a map it gives us. Okay, so here's here's a picture. So we've got you hooked up. You're sitting in front of the screen. I'm getting a whole bunch of different measurements on my screen. So the way my, say, for example, my room is set up. One, I have multiple rooms, but one of my rooms, I might be sitting here. You're sitting in front of the screen so I can watch you. And I have my screen and I'm making the changes on my screen based on the information that your brain is giving me about the different brain waves. And I'll talk about the brain waves in a second over here. So this kind of gives you an idea. So the sensors are placed, the brain waves are displaced here on my thing. And when the brain wave gets to the frequency I want it to go to, you receive the reward and you like the reward. So you want to go to that frequency more and you stay in it. I'm basically going and assisting the brain in. Is that that? Oh, no, oh, which one? No, no. Oh. Ah, so I have to go back all the way here now. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So here you can see. So usually what, I, what we're doing is we're sitting there, we're coaching you. And the coaching that I'll give you when I'm in session with you is just take a deep breath and try to relax. And, and typically if you are in a relaxed state, your brain is going to be really willing to cooperate with what we want it to do. And we may go for a few minutes and then we'll pause because if you're feeling fatigued, you'll always listen to that fatigue and you'll pause for a little bit because the brain is doing some pretty decent chunk of work. So think of neurofeedback as physical therapy for the brain. Okay, you're exercising that brain. So I have a lot of people, I have so many people that come to my clinic that have brains that are fairly functional. Doing pretty okay. Like I have, I have some. Uh, I've gone to the San Diego Rotary Club, and I have a number of members that are like in their eighties, and they're like, okay, you know, I have a really fit brain. I exercise, I garden, I walk five miles every day, but I, I want to come and see what this work is that that you're doing over here. They'll come, and they'll come for your feedback, and so even a well brain can benefit from stimulating because you're just exercising the brain. It doesn't have to necessarily be a brain that's dysregulated. So the, all the conditions that I treat with neurofeedback are like ADHD. We treat addictions. We treat anxiety. I treat a lot of autism. We treat bipolar. We treat brain injuries. Uh, fatigue, chronic fatigue and chronic pain are two of the conditions that respond really well to neurofeedback because pain is really in the brain, right? Think about the pain emanates from the brain. So when we do that rewiring in the brain, then the pain uh, subsides. So I've treated a lot of patients with chronic fatigue. I mean, I have so many people that come to me. I kid you guys not. They'll come to me and they're like, this is my last resort. This is, I've done any, everything and it's on this threat my last resort. And they start to feel the benefit because we're going to the brain. Really going to like the CEO. The brain is the CEO of the whole body. The brain is not well. And obviously we're going to have balance issues. We're going to have movement issues. We're going to have so many different things. So 
with movement and balance. We have certain central strip areas of the brain that we do some very specific work with. So, and I've treated a lot of folks who have had strokes and they've had speech difficulties because we have specific regions of the brain we go to to stimulate speech. I usually like them to wait about two months. Two months after the initial injury, I always tell my patients to wait two months. Now, keep in mind, there's two things, and this is information I learned from my integrative uh, program that uh, the workshops I go to for integrative treatment of neurofeedback. Just initially, right as the injury has occurred, two things that most concussion doctors will talk about, and that is high doses of omega-3s, meaning anything that's 3,600 to 4,200 milligrams the first two to three months, high doses of omega-3. And they've also found that CBD is really uh, helpful in giving birth to new neuronal plasticity for the brain in those first two months. So not past that necessarily, but very high doses in the first two or three months. So what you're describing is what I call a very strong startle response. It's a startle response, right? Uh, folks who have PTSD, folks who have brain injuries, because of the um, severity of what your brain has experienced, you're on guard all the time, right? When you have a brain injury, you are constantly on guard. You're like, okay, can I, am I going to be able to navigate those stairs? What do I need to pay attention to? Let me look around. Let me see what's happening. So you develop a way of being in the world that makes you super hyper vigilant and you're, you know, scanning, right? A lot of scanning. That specific piece lives in the parietal lobe. So this is the parietal lobe, P4, P3. So I, People I treat that have a strong startle response, I'm in the T4, P4 region, and my patients will tell me after five or six sessions that, wow, my startle response has gone down significantly. Wow, so it that's makes great. a beautiful difference. It makes a beautiful difference because otherwise you're like, you know, and, and it's sensory sensitivity. And we all know that with brain injury, you have so many sensory sensitivities that come about. What I love about neurofeedback, actually, which is really good, is it's kind of very time limited because we are going to urge the brain to go to certain pathways, right? We're re rewiring the brain. It's a finite treatment, so beginning to end. Typically, I think that depending on the severity of the issues you're coming in with, that's when I'm usually able to estimate how many sessions you may need. When you have biomechanical issues, Clearly, you will want to continue your physical therapy. You want to make sure you add acupuncture in there if you've never added acupuncture, right? You want to add other things that are at the localized source. And so part of our wellness, I think, is like, you know, once every six weeks, every other month, you establish that routine of your self-care. And from an integrated perspective, we all know that when you've had a uh, an injury to the brain, there are going to be some symptoms that are just going to kind of linger with you as you navigate life, right? So what you do with the resources you have available to you, you figure out ways in which you can get, like say, say if you're limited on financial resources and you still want to get acupuncture regularly, I would go to the School of Acupuncture. That's in Mission Valley because they give you free acupuncture sessions there, right? So you can get regular acupuncture there on a consistent basis because you know your body does well with acupuncture. So that's just part of it. But if you have biomechanical issues, clearly we're going to need to do that. What I think the brain would help you with is if the brain, because you know how with pain, we tend to guard a lot, right? You, you have pain, you tend to stiffen up in those areas and you guard a lot. So the, yeah, that's in the brain. 
So when you when you relax the brain, when you get the brain into a good place, maybe you may not guard as much, and you might be in a place where you just have less more plasticity. It has a potential because remember what happens with the brain is the CEO of the, your whole body. So when we are doing neurofeedback, what we're doing, Miles, is we are actually, first we would want to do with you, I would want to do what we call a brain mapping first, because I want to see where the localized injuries are in the brain. And then we want to go and stimulate those areas of the brain at the frequency at which my, my brain map will tell me to go to. When I go to that frequency that the brain map gives me, then what happens in your brain, there's a word that I use a lot that's called neuroplasticity. Okay. So neuroplasticity means that at any given time in our life, I could be 92 years old and my brain is still has the capacity to grow new neurons. That's neuroplasticity. So the brain has the capacity to grow new neurons at any given point in your life. What neurofeedback does is it actually stimulates those specific regions of the brain where there is less activity. Okay, when I think about a brain injury, like the you either had your skull opened up and you've had brain injury as a result of brain surgery, because I treat a lot of people who've had uh, brain cancer, and then they come in because I consider that a brain injury, right? And the whole brain has been impacted at that point. So what we're doing with neurofeedback miles is we are going specifically to the location of the brain where there is that impairment, and we want to stimulate that area so that the area starts to produce new neurons and neuronal growth. Now, many of my patients will let me know, they'll email me two years after they did whatever level of sessions we did because the neuroplasticity of the brain is such that even when we've stopped the neurofeedback because we put that brain in that direction of growth, it's going to keep growing. So it's a very um, encouraging treatment modality for the brain because what it's doing is it's giving the brain a chance to grow new pathways, new neuronal pathways, neural pathways, new brain cells. I'll talk a little bit about other things that add to neuroplasticity too. Uh, probably eight years ago, I had a young man that I, on a Sunday morning, I used to go out of the goodness of my heart to his residential facility that he was in. So he had had a brain injury that had resulted in such severe brain death that he was fully paralyzed in his whole body. He was not speaking yet or any of those things. Parents had done a lot of work. And I went and probably maybe for six months, I went and did neurofeedback with him. And the changes that came about were little bits of speech but his brain injury was so severe uh, to the brain that there wasn't that much that the neurofeedback made in terms of a significant difference. Uh, consciousness, I, I, not too many of us in our field have been able to do anything significant with that because you know at that state, that brain is in such a vegetative state that neurofeedback, we've not really, I don't read that in any of my listservs or we haven't worked with anybody who's in a state of, uh, uh, in a coma or anything like that. But I would imagine that there would be some practitioners in my field who would be very intrigued by that and, and go and do that research. But there isn't even any research done with, with that. The baseline on what's yeah, going on in the brain. Yeah, yeah. See, and this is one of the reasons why I do like very little talk therapy now, like minuscule amounts, is because I saw so many more. My patients getting well learned with neurofeedback than my traditional talk therapy that I yeah. was doing with them. And that's what I meant when I started out at the outset and I talked about uh, how I ran this clinic and when the patients I put on neurofeedback, those guys got better than the ones who didn't have neurofeedback right. because I am going to the level of the biology of the functioning of your brain. So, so keep in mind, 
when our brain waves, and I'll have a chart that I'll come to that talks about my, the different brain waves. So these are all the different conditions I treat. So, um, so our brain waves are the ones that give the brain the firing. And we've got five or six different kinds of brain waves. Those are the brain waves that when they are dysregulated, they cause some of these underlying conditions. So even my teenagers that I treat, some of my teens, the reason why a lot of the parents will bring the teens with early anxiety or early depression to me is because they, the teen doesn't, they go into therapy and they cross their arms and they don't want to talk. And they're like, there's nothing wrong with me. My mom is just making a big deal about this, you know? And I come in and I'm not even like, I don't even ask about their insights at all. And they love that. But then they leave feeling better. And the teenagers never complain about coming for neurofeedback because they know whatever it is that happens in that room makes them feel better and they're happy to go. It's right front. So right front. So I would have a sense of fear. And that's when you feel kind of hopeless, you feel discouraged. You don't because our right brain is our emotional self, and the left brain is more your logical analytical, that goal directed. The nice part is I never have to have any discussions with that person about how they're sabotaging themselves because they've had enough people having discussions with them about that. All I go in there and I go and work on the brain. I have so many psychologists who refer patients to me because they feel stuck with that patient. They know that there's a lot more that this person is capable of going to, but they're not going there. And when I go and I do some of that stimulation, sure enough, some of them start to feel so much better that they stop psychotherapy or others will go into their psychotherapy and they start doing a lot more work. I have treated migraines very successfully. Yeah, yes, it works on my base. And we also treat epilepsy. So, you know, there's, and we think of migraines uh, in our neurofeedback world, we think about migraines as uh, these intense uh, electrical bursts of energy that happen in the brain. And what I come in with the migraines is I have like a C3, C4 site I do and a T3, T4 site that I specifically do for migraines. So migraines reduce in intensity. Eventually, over time, they subside. My patients who are epileptic as well, they tend to reduce their dosage of medications on after they're doing no feedback. So there's a pretty significant difference. Yeah. Yeah. So an aneurysm, as I think about it, is your blood bleed. And when you have uh, somebody who's had a stroke, they've yes. had a, a bleed in the brain. Uh, and I've treated a lot of patients who are stroke survivors. And it depends on what they're specific. So the type, what I will do with the neurofeedback will depend on the brain, the QEG, the brain mapping that I'll get for, for that person. And I will want then to specifically target those areas and see the change we have. Typically, once I'm targeting an area, about within 10, 10 to 12 sessions, um, if you're not seeing an impact happening in the brain, then that means it may not necessarily be moving things in the brain the way we want them to move. Because it's it's pretty, <laughs> if, I, if it's being done correctly, it's a pretty effective methodology that starts to move the brain. So what TMS does right now, the research with TMS is they, the research they present is usually for two conditions, OCD and depression. Um, so remember, TMS is electromagnetic stimulation. There's this huge uh, thing you have over your head, and they zone in on a very narrow, very, very, very specific region of the brain, and they give the electromagnetic radiation into that region of the brain. So it's very targeted, very, very targeted. And I have a lot of patients who have had success with TMS for their depression and for their OCD. TMS doctors will tell you they don't treat concussions. They don't treat brain injuries. What we do, the reason why we in the neurofeedback world are able to do that is because we are able to go to many more regions of the brain. Like my one of my systems that I have, the, the one I bought specifically for concussions, 
we start out here, then we go here. It's, it's bilateral. So I go over the whole brain and then I come back up again. Then I have sensors here. Then I have some sensors in here. I have some sensors here. I'm going to lots of regions of the brain. So it's much more global compared to how targeted TMS is. But I have a lot of patients who may not have responded well. And, or I have some patients who will call me and they'll say, we want to come for neurofeedback. Our insurance company is fighting us on that because they want us to go and do TMS. And I'll tell them, go ahead and do TMS. See what impact it has on your brain. Because again, even if I'm, if, if I'm, when I'm doing depression, I have certain regions. Even if I've gone straight to the depression spots, because of the neuroplasticity of the brain, if one region of the brain has been made to feel better, it talks to the rest of the brain and starts spreading that love around. Think about it better, right? That's the neuroplasticity of this beautiful brain that we have. It's always open to any new stimulation we get. <laughs> yeah. To traditional neurofeedback, we're not putting any electrical pulses into the brain at all. But when I'm doing my direct neurofeedback, that microcurrent neurofeedback, that it's called, there's a company called Lens, L-E-N-S. They're the ones who came into the world of the microcurrent neurofeedback initially. And they've reported some very significant shifts. And it is, it is gentler and kinder. And it's not where you're, even in ECT now, electroconvulsive therapy, is very successful. I'm, I'm not rejecting it at all. It's very successful in treatment-resistant depressions because there are some depressions and now they're putting those uh, electrodes inside the brain. There's that deep brain stimulation that they're doing for some of these deep depression conditions. So our field of neuroscience is growing by leaps and bounds right now because we are doing more invasive therapies. If you have a practitioner who's well-trained and sophisticated, you should not have any side effects. Uh, the worst side effect that any of my patients experience, and it can show up in the session so I know how to correct it right away, is a slight headache. And when I treat especially my brain-injured people, I am very careful. And, and I'm, I go very slow and I'm very gentle because I do not want to trigger any kind of brain instabilities because you've already had the most severe brain instability that has occurred. The, we're working on the cortex of the brain. We're on the surface area of the brain. And then because of the changes that start to happen there, those move into your deeper pathways of the brain. Now, part of what I do is I'm very clear about in neurofeedback, one of the things I do do is I talk a lot about lifestyle issues. I don't talk about psychotherapeutic issues per se, but are you moving? Are you taking your supplements? Have you begun to think about meditation? Because we know there's a lot of research about the positive impact of meditation on our brain's health. So I don't, uh, Helen, I don't do any visualization techniques or anything like that in my work I do with brain injuries, because what I do very specifically is the brain stimulation. Uh, but I think that visualization has a really powerful role uh, in terms of if we visualize, we know that there's a lot of neuroscience that has shown that if you can visualize yourself walking, you're actually stimulating that region of your motor, motor cortex for it to begin to want to generate neurons in that area. And then when you do that extra work with, you know, the whether it's in your physical therapy, you're doing that work or with your brain uh, rehab place or something like that, that it has a strong impact. I mean, there's 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 a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of information in the world of neuroscience about how um, visualization triggers neuronal pathways in the brain. So it is a very powerful treatment. I just don't utilize that in my clinic. I haven't. No, you're planting a, a seed in my mind here, my dear. This is not good. <laughs> I'm doing it as it is. But yeah, there's a powerful place for that. That's a lovely question. Beautiful question. 
Okay, so, so keep in mind, brain waves are what drive the neurons in the brain. When the EEG changes, so does behavior, attention, mood, affect. And, and what the brain is doing when the EEG is changing in the brain, we're then changing the functioning of the brain. Okay. So what, what brain training does is it improves the flexibility of cognition. It allows our arousal states. And that's what we were talking about is that half of arousal state. It regulates those arousal states. It improves sleep. Oftentimes, it's interesting, no matter what condition I might be working with, I'm always like interested in your sleep. How is your sleep? How is your sleep? Because sleep is the most regenerative thing we do for our brain. How many of you dream? Dream. Okay. Dreaming is a beautiful thing for the brain. I have so many patients I work with and they'll be like, I don't even know if I dream. I, I have no idea if I dream or not. What happens in the brain is when we dream, what happens in the brain is all the neurons shrink. The cerebrospinal fluid flushes in through the spinal column through our brain and it removes all the toxins from the brain and flushes them out. So dream, sleep, has a very important role in cleansing the toxins in our brain. And toxins are created by stress. As something as simple as stress creates toxins in my brain. A well-functioning brain will make you dream a lot because yeah. you're like carrying all this and you're doing all, you're, you're all over the place. You're doing so much so that when the brain shuts down, the brain is like, oh my God, talk about how much this guy collected in the day today. Let's give him lots of dream sleep and, and get the brain cleansed. Right. The brain, a, a function, a well-functioning brain cannot help but dream. A brain that is in a little bit of a disarray, and the disarray could come about with something as huge as a brain injury or depression. That brain may not dream as much. When it doesn't dream as much, it, it, it might have very short spurts of REM sleep. If it doesn't dream as much, then it's not rejuvenating itself as much. And so you want, uh, yeah, every brain dreams because it's for the functioning of the brain. We know that there's a very strong connection between the length of sleep that somebody has had through their life and Alzheimer's. People who tend to be prone to Alzheimer's will often have had very small sleep cycles. They don't sleep that much four or five hours a night or six hours or something is what they do. When I do my first meeting with my patients and they're going to get started in treatment, one of my standard lines I'll tell my patients is, don't get alarmed. You're going to start having some pretty intense vivid dreams. They'll be gnarly, they'll be all over the place, they won't be connected with anything that's happening in the daytime, but my neural feedback is gonna be activating a lot of dreaming for you. So I pre-warn them and I tell them to get excited about dreaming. So when they come back and they start reporting that they're dreaming, they're like, whoa, it was something else. I don't even wanna know what it was all about, but it was like random things, but yes, I'm dreaming. So people start to get very excited. If you can give you peaceful dreaming, nightmares and night terrors, we treat nightmares and night terrors very successfully with neurofeedback. We treat nightmares very successfully because especially when we've been through a traumatic incident, you think about it, your brain and your, in its sleep state, your brain is going to be remembering it again. The brain wants to, the, the, the dream state, like for Jungian analysts or people who analyze dreams, what you're doing is you're really trying to make sense of things that happen in your world. And you're trying to connect the dots on that, right? You're trying to connect the dots. So the dreaming that is disruptive dreaming that gets you thrashing about in bed. Sleepwalking, we treat really well with mirror feedback. Sleep talking, we treat well. Snoring reduces. Sleep states improve. That's usually, that's one of my first places I'm just going to chase after. 
with what I do, with my level of experience, I'm sure there might be other neurofeedback practitioners who may be able to do better um, better with aphasia. I have um, treated two or three people where there's been a slight improvement with their aphasia, just a slight improvement, not significant, but slight. But what I always tell them is that slight improvement you have with the aphasia that's going to make a very big difference because remember, we've set the pathways along. Now I want you to go back and I want you to do some more speech therapy because, and I like to work in unison with speech therapies because what I'm doing with the brain, what they'll be able to do with their speech therapy is going to be so much more powerful because of how I'm making the brain a more fertile ground for it to be able to latch onto speech therapy. So neurofeedback alone is not going to do it. You'd want that combination of of, uh, the speech therapy. But you know what will happen is if you start sleeping with lots of dreams, we don't know what your brain is going to do in those speech areas. That that could be exciting. So certain medications will also uh, keep you from dreaming. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. That's right. right. It's okay. And it's okay. I think if those medications are medications you need to be on and they improve functioning in other areas of your life. But again, what I say to you is... Keep in mind, meditation is very powerful for the healing of the brain. So you may not dream as much, but if you add meditation there and you do a half an hour consistently every day, that in itself is going to make a huge difference for you for that lack of dreaming you might have because you're still growing more neuronal pathways with meditation. Really improves things. I'm a big believer of meditation. And the nightmares are the brain has gotten hijacked because of fear. The fear hijacked the brain so much. So the nightmares are brain trying to make sense of it, the brain brain trying to create some safety. But if it can create safety in the brain during its waking moments, then at night when it goes goes into sleep, it can have a more restful sleep. Other patients that are just like moving all over the bed and everything like that, and their family members will say, wow, you know, their sleep has become so restful. It's kind of nice because you see that in be pretty good with like restless legs and different things, different sleep conditions that we have. Those are treated pretty well. We have got a lot of success with them. Yeah. Um, concentration, focus. Obviously, you know, uh, there's frontal areas that we'll do a lot of work in. And one, two, we'll be in this area a whole lot of concentration improves, focus improves. Um, because of my training as a psychologist, I'm able to guide you towards supplements that you can take too that help you with the concentration and focus. So there's a couple of things that we use that that are pretty good for the brain. So uh, there it's um, Percepta, P-E-R-C-E-P-T-A. Percepta is a supplement that I suggest to a lot of my patients with brain injuries. Uh, it's got a, I'm sure some of your acupuncturists or integrative doctors might have told you about this, but cat's claw, it's an herb that's supposed to be really good with helping more neurons grow in the brain. So Percepta, I've had patients who've had brain injuries that have taken Percepta for two to three years, and they can tell that there's a shift in their cognition, their brain is more alert, they can feel a better focus and all of that. So it's a and this apparently the scientist who's created it, he was in the National Institute of Health for 30 years, and he had done so much research. The other thing that uh, Percepta does is, you know, when you have the brain injuries and you start to have these tangles you have in the brain that eventually will lead, you know, to other brain conditions, the Percepta reduces the tangles in the brain. He had been doing this research for 30 years with National Institute of Health. And they just wouldn't come around and allow him to produce a product. So after 30 years, he left and then he created his own lab and he makes Percepta. And Prevagen is often not for somebody with brain injury. I go with Percepta with brain injury, not Prevagen. Prevagen is more for age-related memory, cognitive decline. Like when you're in your 80s and you're feeling like, yeah, I'm not like quite catching things. But but Percepta is what I'd like my patients to take. Uh Uh-huh. What is a brain tangle? Okay, Um, so when a brain has had injury, because of the way in which the brain begins to uh, 
unravel itself. Let's use this acronym because the brain unravels itself. There is a product called there are there's a protein called the tau protein T A U tau protein that increases in the brain, and that tau protein will tend to cause tangles in the brain. Tangles in the brain are early signs of you developing dementia or Alzheimer's down the road because of the brain being uh, creating excess tau protein. What the perceptor does is it causes a nice reduction in those tangles in the brain. So basically you're kind of delaying the onset of any kind of dementia or any sort of Alzheimer's or anything uh, that occurs as a result of brain injuries. It's a supplement, so it's not a prescription. It's, it's an over-the-counter. It's an over-the-counter. It's, it's not, it is not, yeah. Yeah, but it's one I tell any of my patients that come in that have had brain injuries, I'm always having them start Perceptor. This is healing the brain. It's actually like really healing the brain. Um, I'm also big about omega-3s, taking good probiotics. I talk a lot about because the health of your gut determines the health of your brain, especially when you've had a brain injury. And I'm always talking about how toxic alcohol is to the brain, especially if you've had brain injury. You don't want to be messing with alcohol. It's not very really helpful at all. So, um, so you want to reduce toxins when you take probiotics and you have a real good gut microbiome, you have a gut microbiome, the, through our vagus nerve is like your, our feel good chemical serotonin, you know, the one that prescribed by Prozac and Epaxor and all of those, 95% of the serotonin is made in your gut. And through the vagus nerve is how it's taken to the brain. So when you eat foods that are whole foods, so if you eat whole foods and you're eating greens and you eat a lot of fish and you eat like kind of like your Mediterranean diet, that makes a really big difference with the health of your brain. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Oh, all right. Ten minutes. So the rate of the brain wave firing is related to the rate of the state of our arousal and neurofeedback shifts and nudges the brain wave firing. So that's what it looks like when you're seated. My, my systems are different than this. So it improves your function by how it improves the functioning of your brain. That's how it improves your function. So these are like when we're doing our QEEGs, this is how we're collecting from 19 different sites. We're collecting the electrical activity of the brain. And then these are the different brain wave patterns that we have. We have regular brain waves. You've got your theta and gamma. These are your alpha and beta. So if these brain waves are, these are the ones that if they're dysregulated, they're going to show up as, as structural. So before we do neurofeedback, we're always waiting to see where the dysregulation is. We figure out the best system because I have three different kinds of systems and I have five machines, three of the same kind because I love that machine. Um, we will personalize your care. We will, I will figure out which one is going to be the best. Yes, yes. So that's why when we're doing the, when we're doing the report on the brain mapping, we will, every step of the way, we're always going to be asking you, are you right-handed or left-handed? Because when we compare your brain with the database of thousands of people that gave us the report, we want to be comparing yours with left-handed people. Left-handed people. Left yeah. yeah. The database is left-handed and right-handed. So we need to know. Depending on, you know, how you are in the world, some people are predominantly left-handed and they might kick with their right foot. It could even be, so that's a little bit of crossing in the brain and that can create a potential for what we call extra noise in the brain. If you have extra noise in the brain, then to do some tests, it might take you a little bit longer because the brain is a little bit noisy. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I love okay. brains like yours. Okay. I love working <laughs> with brains like yours. Those are exciting brains for me to work with because it's like, yes, let's get going. <laughs> so it's not going to make it difficult. If anything, it's just going to calm down a lot of that noise that's in the brain. And that's what I meant is, you know, when we are that ambidextrous, 
uh, that can, if you're left leaning, it's all fine. If you're right leaning, that's all fine. But some people lean a little bit left and lean a little bit left, right. And then yeah. that's what creates noise in the brain. Yeah. 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 So we'll see, you know, when we do your brain math, we'll see what shows up yeah. with that. What we'll okay. want to do is and probably a lot of the training I'll be doing will be on your left side because the way the brain works is if there's injury That's on the right. Injury occurred as well on the left side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll be doing a lot more work here and that impacts the right side. And if you have injury to the left side of the brain, that's going to impact your left, right. left side. I would do one or the other. I never have you start Prozac and do this at the same time. Okay. Then you won't be able to, yeah. I came into this world because I wanted their majority of the people who reach out to me come to me because they don't want the medication approaches to yeah. balancing the brain. Insurance covers it. Um, there's uh, two CPT codes. We use 90876 and 90901. I'm in Sorrento Valley. Currently, we're not accepting any insurances in my clinic. I said it that way, but in about a year we're working, I have a consultant I've specifically hired to make sure that we apply for as many insurances as we can apply for, because I really want this treatment modality to become available to more people. Uh, I'm in the middle of a, a move. We're going to move in April, May. And then our person only wants us to apply after the move because apparently when you apply for insurances and then if your address changes, it's supposed to be a nightmare to, to walk through. So we'll apply in April and April sometime then. And then it takes about six to nine months before we can start accepting insurances. So currently okay. I'm not. From some of my colleagues who do take insurance, they said that medical has not been covering neurofeedback. So I am... And and TRICARE does not cover neurofeedback. So I'm like so livid about that. I said, considering how many military folks we have, and how many people have experienced brain injuries, TRICARE does not cover neurofeedback. So we've got some things within our system that are not very user-friendly. What's really good, you know, neurofeedback has been around for th over 32 years. And we never developed the lobby in Washington, D.C. That, that psychiatrists have been able to have, which is why TMS is like, boom, it's through the door and insurance companies are covering it. And TMS is $1,000 a treatment, one treatment. It's three weeks long. It's $1,000 a treatment. Insurance covers 100% of it. Neurofeedback typically is $150 a treatment, particularly because with my brain injury, I'll be doing my direct neurofeedback. That's the one that I like. The sessions are actually not bad. Other machine, they're a bit long. Uh, the the D DN machine, you can be in and out within about 35 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes. It's fairly, fairly, fairly efficient. I have a set protocol I go through. So it's a very systemized way and it, and it gives me a fantastic result. Because the MDs have a huge lobby in Washington, D.C., and they're able to get whatever they have, they're able to get it through. Whereas in my neurofeedback world, we've only created a group like in the last five years, that's a stronger group that's starting to show up in D.C. with all the lobbies we need to be. Yeah. I mean, it's a political game. Mm -hmm. MDs, only MDs can do a QE, uh, only MDs can do uh, the TMS and PhDs can do the neurofeedback and master's level licensed psycho licensed people can do neurofeedback. You have to be licensed. I recently have begun to treat three or four patients with long COVID symptoms mm -hmm. and they've gone to so many things and it has not helped. And my direct neurofeedback is helping them. So I have a lot of confidence in that machine that, that I bought. It was very expensive, but I bought it and it's all paid off. One of the things I'm doing in my practice now is I'm opening an office in East Lake and I'm opening an office in Temecula because I have people that come and travel very far to come to me because this is not a treatment modality. And then I'm working at, at, with my business person I've hired. I'm working on creating partnerships with other psychologists 
and other licensed providers. So I can come in and I can teach you how to add this to your practice because it's a fantastic thing for people to add to their practice. And they don't know, I don't know, 2011. When I went to that thing and my and this lady was just like raving about it. And then I took my son to her. So I had a PhD, I gotten all my degrees and everything like that. And I never knew about it. So it's not surprising. And I I, I share your frustration, sir. Absolutely. These people don't know about me. Really? Yeah. I have UCSD concussion clinic that will refer a lot of patients to me because they did have neurofeedback there. And but they're not using it as much now. So they'll often refer people to me. Um, so she called me, my daughter called me and she's like, Mama, can I come into the office like on a Sunday when you don't have any of your patients around? She's like, because my sleep is so off. And I just know that if I do two sessions, my sleep will be like a little So I came in two Sundays in a row. I hooked her up and boom, she was off and running when she was fine for the rest of it. So this is what it, uh, the Q feedback looks like. So here's before neurofeedback, and then you can see the changes that happen in the brain. Anything that's red is something that's out of the norm. So the brain map is a very good diagram of what parts of the brain are off the norm. And then we go strategically to those and treat those directly. So I didn't talk at all about the different regions of the brain. So we can, you know, your frontal lobe is the one that has all the behavior changes, problems, thinking, organizing. Then when I said parietal lobe, when we talked about the hypervigilant response, that's this parietal lobe. And there's a whole bunch of different things we do there. Then we've got the occipital lobe because a lot of times, say your frontal, you hit somewhere like this, then because of the quantum concussion you have in the back, Visual issues are huge. That's one of the reasons why you have so many visual pieces. So we have areas we stimulate in the occipital lobe. So this is just now the balance and movement are in the deep, deep regions of the brain. So neurofeedback is working on the surface of the brain. So those are some of the more challenging ones. So that's why when I went to that rehab center and worked on that young man for like for maybe a year or six months or something, it didn't make a difference with movement and balance. It made a little bit of difference within the speech in the areas I could do uh, on the cortex. You have a question? Yeah, but you said that it does help with vision. It helps with vision. Oh, yeah. That helps with vision. Yeah. Definitely helps with vision. Um, and clarity within, like, after the end, like, after the second or the third session, most of my patients will say, it's like I'm seeing colors again and everything seems lighter and brighter, but that's with that direct air feedback. Yeah. So the side of the left brain is logical, verbal, digital, symbolic order. Right is the artistic, the emotions, the imaginations, the colors, all that is your right side of the brain. And then I'm really big, as I mentioned, yoga, Pilates, any movement that we can do. Uh, omega threes, vitamin D. You know, vitamin D is. I, I'll catch that question. Okay. In a vitamin D is a very, very important vitamin for the health of the brain. So you want to keep those vitamin D. I always tell my patients to take your vitamin D levels almost as high as eighty. Your regular doctors, if you're like in the twenty-five to thirty-five region or close to thirty-five or something, they're like, "Oh, your vitamin D levels are good." What we've found is that brain and neurologic conditions, the higher you keep your vitamin D levels, the better brain functions. So it may mean you take 10,000 IUs of vitamin D daily until you get your, and it's always a good idea to combine the vitamin D with the vitamin K because the K allows you to absorb the D better. The meditation, acupuncture, exercise, your nutrition, Meditation is very generative for the brain. Meditation. Okay, so when we have brain injuries, part of what happens is in our DNA, we have these things called telomeres that are at the tail end of your DNA. Telomeres, T-E-L-O-M-A-R-E-S. Those telomeres with stress and brain injuries get shortened. Shortened telomeres means uh, the health of your body and the health of your brain gets compromised. People who are under a lot of stress, people who get cancer, people who get high blood pressure tend to have shorter telomeres. Okay? Brain injury patients have shorter telomeres. Meditation by itself, not even adding neurofeedback or anything in there, meditation increases the length of your telomeres. 
So it's phenomenal. Meditation is very good for the brain. Half an hour a day in the morning prepare. I just sit down and I close my eyes and I catch my breath. I just take my breath in. In meditation, your brain will not slow down. It will not calm down. If anything, it might pick up momentum. Your thoughts might increase. Let it be. When certain thoughts come up in my mind and I'm, I come back to my breath, but I put that thought on a leaf and I send it down the river. I have another meditation I do that's called passage meditation. So I've memorized some passages. And what I do is I slowly speak those passages. The minute a thought interrupts, because you know how thoughts are going to be there all the time. Thoughts never go away. They shoot. Otherwise, it'd be dead. Thought comes in. In my passage meditation, I have to start from the beginning again. So my passage meditation, I think I've gone through the, it's supposed to be eight lines. I think I've only gone through two lines in a meditation season. Yeah. <laughs> I still keep coming back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then here's a couple of books, uh, a book that I like a lot that gives, that I should keep actually. This I shared with you. It's the one that says Neurofeedback 101. It's a great book. Michael Cohen is the author. It's a really good book. He yeah. explains things very simply and in an easy to understand manner. He's not a psychologist, so he doesn't use a lot of big words and fancy terms. Or... So this is what I have, guys. I hope. It's valuable and useful. So I'm just so delighted that I could come and speak to your community because you guys are in my heart because this is huge what happens to the brain when, when we have these uh, hits to the brain. Yes, Doctor. So much. Thank you. 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 Thank I hope everyone's gotten a bunch of great information and we thank you again so much for coming out. We thank you for joining us online. Uh, we're just hoping that you've gotten all the information that you need. And, and, and lean on me. I mean, I'm always happy to answer questions. And because remember, like with Dr. Cameron, we are, I'm very connected in the brain injury talk. So there may be other, other resources that come my way. And then I always go to my conference and August, and so I come back with new ideas and, and new information. So I like to keep us as well on the cutting edge. Thank you all so much. Ready. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So